Today's episode of Bitcoin People proudly brought to you by WeSpeakInBitcoin.com, bringing you the biggest names in Bitcoin for speaking engagements and sponsorship opportunities. Enjoy today's chat. Hello, and a big, fabulous, warm welcome to Peter Dunworth, who has been a financial advisor in a multifamily business for many years now and starting his own Bitcoin advisor business shortly. Welcome aboard, Peter Dummer. Harry, it's a pleasure to be here. Thrilled to be talking with you. It's so good to be talking with you. Uh, I've listened to you philosophizing with Knut and I've heard you doing uh, deep dive valuations about Bitcoin, all of which I'd like to get into. But let's just set up for the audience, for those who don't know you, let's get into a little bit, little bit of background so we can just really set up your credentials and they can understand a bit about your background in traditional finance uh, that helps them to kind of see why a traditional finance guy might have been drawn to Bitcoin because, in fact, many people in TradFi don't... Um, almost deliberately avoid or or choose not to learn about Bitcoin and understand it deeply. So let's just set up a little bit of background, if you wouldn't mind, Peter, please. Sure thing. Well, I've been in finance for 25 years, so two and a half decades. I started out my career, um, I guess, you know, post-school at, at university, studied accounting and finance, found finance very easy to do. It just came naturally to me and accounting was uh, was just an absolute slog to tell you the truth it was very hard work there was nothing exciting about it and it was just um, not my favorite topic so I, I said to myself I'd much rather go into finance than accounting and so rather than pursuing accounting went into finance where I, I worked spent my cut my teeth um, in a funds management business called BT Funds Management um, nearly 25 years ago which was one of the largest fund managers um, in Australia at the time, and one of the most successful, their claim the to old, fame. The old Bankers Trust, yeah? That's exactly yeah, right. I remember. <laughs> their claim to fame was picking the 1987 stock market crash and getting their clients out before it happened. Um, I, I'd like to think that we emulated that success while I was there, but the, the results show a different standing. <laughs> so after, after that, I went into the other side of the balance sheet in, in credit. So worked in credit for maybe 10 years, basically assessing risk um, from a mortgage perspective, having a look at quality of borrowers, uh, collateral, have a deep understanding of what makes a good credit risk and what doesn't make a good credit risk across all sorts of lending when it comes to you know, traditional residential lending to commercial lending. Uh, different types of property have different risk profiles. And so working on you know the debt or the credit side of the balance sheet was a really good um, I guess, really good at developing my knowledge base for assessing risk because that's fundamentally what credit is. It's all risk. And so um, in in about uh, 2007, um, I had some great advice from a, a dear family friend uh, who basically said, you're on the wrong side of the balance sheet. You need to move across to the other side because there's some problems coming down your way. And that was such prophetic advice because you know a year later we had the GFC and everyone knows what happened to the credit markets in that period of time, we saw a, a whole host of absolute carnage in the credit markets. Australian credit was absolutely affected too. We saw probably the the one of the most negatively affected from that whole outcome was RAMs, mortgages. You know, you had clients clamoring to get all sorts of interest rates uh, or even struggling to secure credit that they had on their home loan. It really disjointed the Australian credit market. Yeah. And luckily I was wasn't oblivious to it. I was very conscious of what was happening there, but didn't have to deal with it on the day-to-day -day because I was then working on the other side of the balance sheet, giving advice on equities and financial advice. And the thing with financial advice is it's it's quite, well, depending on how much time and effort you want to put into it, can, can really cover a very broad range of topics. So it's not just equities advice or investment advice. It can cover a whole host of things that cover someone's financial life from insurances to credit to, you know, properties to advice on stocks, bonds, even artwork um, from an investment category perspective. And then there's also having a look at from a tax structuring perspective, although you're not 
as a financial advisor licensed to give specific advice when it comes to structuring entities and the like. Just being in and around, you know, client needs and seeing how that's structured gives you a really good understanding of, you know, how people can structure things, not only to affect a much better outcome from a tax perspective, but to give uh, clients a much better outcome from preserving their wealth and protecting from any type of litigation, which is critical in this type of environment where we feel, I feel like it's getting far more litigious. So, Really? So we're seeing that happen in Australia now as well, because it was it's always been thought of as a US thing. That's right. And we are seeing that more here. So um, sort of dealing across basically a broad range of advice. Um, 10 years ago, I set up a or nearly 10 years ago now, we set up a multifamily office where we look after a very small number of wealthy families and give them advice, specifically investment advice across a broad range of asset classes. Typically that covers properties um, from residential, commercial, industrial and office um, right the way through to multifamily um, residential in the US. Uh, we look at bonds, Although we can't get excited about bonds, and I think there are so many issues with the bond markets and credit markets, there's even bigger issues with the derivatives market, and that's you know that's even more opaque than the credit markets. Um, we give advice across you know stocks as well, individual stocks as well as managed funds, private equity, venture capital, and of course my all-time favorite alternative asset is Bitcoin. So. Magnificent. So let's go straight down that rabbit hole. I understand your brother was highly influential in orange filling you and bringing on board with Bitcoin, but you had reservations, which I would imagine most traditional finance people would do. Yes. And it took a bit of convincing. And I, just as many people of, I think, yours and my age, probably need a fair bit of convincing. Yeah. Uh, I, and, you know, maybe it's not even an age-related thing. Maybe it's just people hear a lot of negative press. So what was your journey then? Well, it's it's probably quite typical of most people. I, I was very sceptical of Bitcoin to start with. I thought it was magic internet money. I thought it would never work. I, you know, you would think that a grounding, literally a lifelong education in business, entrepreneurship, accounting and finance, and then working in credit markets and equity markets would be perfect schooling for understanding a new asset class. And this is the paradox of Bitcoin is that it was the complete opposite. Because of my traditional schooling or education across the financial markets, across business and across you know everything to do with you know money, that kind of was a stumbling block for me because I had to effectively unlearn everything that I'd learned in the traditional sense. So, mm. and, and this is, you know, the paradox of Bitcoin is that, you know, you think that, oh, because you're smart with money, you'll get it quickly. It's like, no, it's actually counterintuitive because I think if, if I go back to probably the, you know, one of the life lessons that I was given from very early on as, as a child, and it was reiterated to me throughout the years, even to this day. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And this is, I think, one of the problems that Bitcoin falls into. And, you know, the meme, as much as I agree with it, Bitcoin fixes this or Bitcoin fixes everything. Um, it does not serve our purpose in helping broaden or deepen someone's understanding because when someone hears that, you know, the little red flag that they were told from, you know, literally knee high just rings alarm bells in the head that says red flag, red flag, ding, ding, ding. We can now disregard everything that's said from this moment on. Yeah. And, and and this is where you have to have, I think, a high, well, it's for the initiated. You need to spend a huge amount of time and energy learning about this. And, and if you want to understand it on a deeper level, and this is where say from a from a work perspective where I'm really fortunate is that because clients understand what my background is, they understand how much, you know, I understand about, you know, investment markets and the rest of it. And they trust me to invest, you know, their money for them. When I suggest something, I don't suggest it lightly. They understand that I'm ultra conservative in my recommendations when it comes to money. And they know that I have 
a high degree of risk aversion when it comes to losing money. Like I'm talking an abnormal degree of, of risk aversion when it comes to that. So when I say to a client, hey, I think we should put 5 to 10% of your net assets in this, it's sit up, eyes wide open, like, how, how are you telling me this? Because I'm here talking to you because I trust you to invest my money wisely and safely. How can you justify putting 10% in what they perceive to be a risky asset? And then that's where the journey starts about, well, the conversation around risk v volatility that, mm -hmm. you know, often in, and this is, I don't know if it's a byproduct of our current environment that we have a very limited attention span or alternatively, we have a media that basically delivers us 30 second snippets and we're not, you know, capable of, of looking or concentrating for further than a minute to really dig into a topic. But the media's obsession with conflating risk and volatility, particularly when it comes to Bitcoin, is a huge disservice to Bitcoin and understanding what that is. And I only had a conversation about this this afternoon that if you understand the risks involved with the broader market, and you compare that to the risks involved with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. it is a no-brainer. Like, it is an absolute layup that you should have a substantial amount of your money invested in Bitcoin. And yeah. if you really understood how bad the other markets were, stocks, properties, and bonds, you'd have a much larger component than 10%. Yeah. And this is where there's the education process in delineating what is risk from volatility. Yes, this is a highly volatile asset. However, it's a very low risk option when you put a time frame for investing of five to 10 years. And this is where I look at it. I think most of my clients are planning for intergenerational wealth. We're trying to plan for their children and their children's children and how to effectively pass on that wealth from, uh, you know, basically in stages and, not only preserve that wealth, and, and that's the primary concern. It's not a matter of, you know, return return on capital, it's return of capital. So yeah. clients, clients aren't worried about making a return on money. They just don't want to lose it. And yeah. this is where when presented with Bitcoin, it represents the, the juxtaposition of, hang on a second, I want return of capital, not return on capital. Why are you mentioning something that's so volatile or mm -hmm. risky? And it's like, well... Therein lies the paradox. We have a relatively low risk asset compared to everything else and a highly volatile one, but it's volatile to the upside. So this is the ideal asset that we want to be supplanting in someone's portfolio because when we look at it and you know we're, we're you know, effectively building portfolio construction for clients where we look at what type of assets need to go into it to achieve certain outcomes, a minimum allocation should be somewhere between two to five percent. But once a client understands and gets comfortable with the risk, and we take them on that journey to really understand that, and that's literally the most important thing I can do as an investment advisor today is get them down that rabbit hole and really understand deeply what the risks are to that. They realize that they might not understand the broader risk in the other assets, but they understand that Bitcoin is a far less risky asset than is advertised and this is where you know we go down and spend a lot of time talking about bitcoin being the most secure computing network on earth it's been the most successful network from an uptime perspective over the last you know 10 or 12 years i know it's been around for longer but you know it's been the most successful network it hasn't had a rollback of its ledger and so it's an immutable ledger there are all these things that once clients go down that rabbit hole and we take them down that they then start to get comfortable with oh okay well if we can disassociate ourselves that risk is not volatility rather mm. than conflating the two, then we can get comfortable with adding to that position because they understand that from a long-term perspective, this is really a hedge on our entire system. And that affords the greatest chance of success for what they're trying to achieve. That's great. I have never heard risk versus volatility spelt out like that um, so clearly before. So when you talk about a hedge against our entire system, let's expand on that for the listener because let, let's spell out um, the, the risks as you understand it with what's going on currently with the um, 
with the traditional and fiat system as you and I know it. Okay. As the world lives it. Yeah. So, you know, if we um if we go through the asset classes that we've got sitting presented to us today, and you know, just for you know anyone listening in perpetuity, but it's basically early May of 2023. What we've seen over the last 12 months is we've seen interest rates go from zero percent or 0.25 percent in the US to near five five percent in the US. This is an unprecedented rise in interest rates. These interest rates have effectively decimated the bond markets. They've caused effectively banks to become insolvent in the US. In the last month, we've seen four made, uh, four substantial banks blow up. And it's really interesting that the first three banks to blow up were crypto banks. And they tried to blame it on crypto, but this is not a crypto problem. This is a broader problem across the whole, uh, across the whole US banking sector that every single bank is afflicted with the same issue that they're fundamentally insolvent. However, the US or well, the Federal Reserve, the US Federal Bank is going to backstop all of the banks by effectively providing bonds to them. Now, that sets the backdrop for the, for the macro environment that we're in right now. And if I look at, you know, from an investment perspective, what we're looking at, we have had the worst performance from a from a 60-40 portfolio in over 100 years last year. And the reason why that happened was because interest rates went through the roof, stock market dropped off, bonds basically fell dramatically. Um, some bonds lost up to 75% of value in, in less than 12 months, which is literally unheard of. And when we look across the asset classes, you're looking at making an investment decision today and you need to determine what that looks like and what you're going to invest in. So looking across the entire spectrum of, of asset classes, you have, I'll start with stocks because they're probably the most popular to look at and, you know, probably the most easily accessible investment that we look at. You're looking at direct stocks and you've seen stock indices across the globe come off dramatically over the last 12 months, particularly 18 months. You've seen growth stocks absolutely hammered. Price to earnings multiples have been crushed. You've got value stocks have actually fared pretty well, despite basically a rising interest rate. It's been a very difficult environment and anyone in the investment world will tell you that this is probably the most difficult time for investing that any one of them has been through. Just have a look at some of the old heads talking on you know, MSNBC and the rest of it, or CNBC, I should say. Um, so the stock market is very difficult to, to invest in. If you look at bonds, bonds are very difficult to invest in too because we've got inflation out of control. They still think that you know interest rates need to go up and effectively if interest rates go up, bond values go down. And a big misconception with bonds is that everyone thinks that bonds are safe and it's money good if we put our money in bonds. That's the most conservative investment that we can make. That is not true. That is completely wrong, particularly in light of what we've been through in the last 12 months. And these figures are a little outdated now, but if you look at what happened between January last year to December last year, long-term bonds lost 30% of their value. Short-term bonds lost nearly 15%. And to think about that in sort of statistical terms, that hasn't happened in nearly 240 years of the bond market existing. Like, wow. It's it's such an outlier from a statistical perspective, and what's really interesting and what's so difficult is in this market in that same period you had the stock indices come off dramatically as well, so there was nowhere to hide. And when you couple that with property, property didn't do great last year either. And property is a very illiquid asset that's very lumpy and moves really slowly. Yet despite that, the property markets, listed REITs, and the rest of it, they came off quite dramatically as well because they're effectively a function of the interest rate because they're paying a yield, they use debt. You know, interest rates go up means they've got less money to pay you. So the value of those properties come down. It's just that simple. So mm -hmm. what's what's really bizarre in sort of the backdrop of hap what happened last year, you know, for the first time in a very long time, you had stocks go down, bonds go down, property go down. Now, in a traditional finance sense, 
you would typically go to your financial advisor and they'd say, we're going to diversify your portfolio across four asset classes. We're going to give you 25% in cash, 25% in bonds, 25% in property, 25% in shares. And that, that has worked for a really long time. But last year that got decimated. And now we're dealing with the recovery of that and the fallout of these insolvent banks in the US. And in addition to that, the next shoe to drop, which I haven't really heard anyone talking about, is the commercial property sector in the US is going to cause a huge amount of carnage for those regional banks because they're the major financiers to the commercial property in the US. And if I'm thinking through second order effects, yeah. you, you have a very difficult situation that when a US bank is insolvent because of the bonds that they invested in, typically the 10-year bond and was put on the balance sheet that they didn't have to mark to market, mm -hmm. they didn't have to price at what the value is, that's okay because the Federal Reserve can just, excuse me, the Federal Reserve can just reissue bonds and make them good. That's easy. It's literally a stroke of a pen or a push of a finger to create another zero on a bond and everyone's happy. Now enter the commercial property sector. Majorly financed or the major financing is done by the regional banks and the some of these you know real estate entrepreneurs are literally handing back the keys to these commercial properties and saying, you deal with it. It's basically a non-recourse lending arrangement in the US where it's different to the Australian sector where we have recourse lending that if you don't um, honour the obligations of your loan, they basically take personal guarantees on the loan and they'll sell your home and take that. Whereas in the US, it's a non-recourse environment where they're only putting up the collateral as the property or the, the, the asset that they're financing. And so if that fails, they just throw the keys back at you and say, your problem, see you later, move on to the next thing. And so I'm watching this shoe drop and thinking, what happens when these commercial properties are under value? Like there are some properties in San Francisco that are, have dropped in value by 50%. They were financed to the tune of 70%. So I'm looking at this and thinking these banks are going to be impaired to the tune of 20% of the value of that, that building that they financed. Now, what does the Federal Reserve do? Do they then buy that building to make the banks good on their shitty lending practices? Or are they going to just drop the rates back to zero because that's the only real way to fix that problem? You're watching this from Australia. You're on top of this. Why are we not seeing this in the mainstream media? I don't Is know. The, the finance guys have got to know what's going on. Are they deliberately holding back? Are they all seeing what's coming? Or are they completely oblivious and, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil? What is going on that this isn't being talked about? I sincerely don't know. And, you know, I just look at this and think, you know, putting two and two together of what's, what's coming down the pipe and... None of it is good, I've got to say. And this is where, you know, that's that's the discussion around property. We've looked at bonds, we've looked at stocks, and it's a common problem across all of these asset classes is what it fundamentally comes down to is we have got a saturation of debt. We have reached saturation point where there is no more debt available to pump into the system that anyone can deal with. And the best analogy is we are literally up to our eyeballs in debt, we cannot take on any more debt, particularly when they've raised the interest rate so much. And so what, what I look at and what, what I think we're starting to see is the, the stock market is basically fully, fully funded from a debt perspective. They can't take on any more debt. Corporate bonds are at all-time highs. Um, corporate buypacks were at all-time highs. Um, they've got huge amounts of debt for working capital and, you know, any sort of, you know, financing they can get they've taken so they can't take any more if we move across to the property sector property sector is capped out they can't take any more debt into that property sector because basically they've jammed the rates up and now the properties aren't here there at that value you can't finance it um, they're going to try to do that though. so this is what i'm interested to see how they figure this problem out it's going to be a study in human psychology to see how they justify this um, and i think that'll happen in the next six to 12 months and then if you look at the bond markets, the bond markets are up to their eyeballs too. You've now got the two largest purchases of US bonds in the Japanese and Chinese government turning around and tapping out saying, we don't want to buy these anymore. So mm -hmm. you've now tapped out the entire bond market. Every single asset class is now up to their eyeballs in debt. And this is the reason sort of to put a bow on it, 
What happened last year was because all of these asset classes were to the eyeballs in debt, they all operated exactly the same way. And that's why we no longer have the, the benefit of having diversification. Indeed. Okay. So you and Lawrence Lepard, who I had on um, a couple of podcasts ago, uh, are both say seeing a significant uh, financial event meltdown of some sort, of some sort of breaking of the system, really, frankly, in the relatively short term. And what I mean by that is 12 months to five years. Having said that, I've seen this can kick down the road for a very long time. I have brought this up in a couple of podcasts I was reading uh, back when I was about 19 or 20, or maybe a little older, uh, a book called The Great Reckoning by, uh, I, do you know it, by James Dale Davidson and William rees uh, And that was basically talking about all of this Mm -hmm. And that was back in the 90s. Yeah. And they had written it in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen this go down the road and I came out of financial markets and I'm still in contact very occasionally with a mate or two from that time. Mm -hmm. And they are gobsmacked at how long this has gone on for and it just seems like it could go on indefinitely. And I and think it can. That's the problem. How does that work? I think it can for two reasons. Firstly, I never underestimate someone, uh, someone's ingenuity or human ingenuity to come up with new ideas to perpetuate the system that they benefit from. So that is a very, uh, it, it is a huge primary driver for people. So I, I don't ever like to bet against humanity. And, you know, <laughs> although it's not the outcome that I want to see, and I would like to see some form of reckoning or hard money instituted, um, yeah, there are a lot of powerful people who are, you know, I guess who benefit from the system continuing the way it does. The the other thing with this is that I think, you know, this can be, can be kicked down the road. The other thing is, you know, the flip side of that is humans have very short memories mm. in that, you know, okay, we take our pain, we do a 1920s style, you know, bang up and bust and everyone's upset three years passes and I guarantee you everyone will get back on that debt train and forget it ever happened. And that's the problem is that our human memory is, you know, and this is probably why, you know, we're still here and still, you know, having babies to this day is that we have a very short memory for pain. Um, and <laughs> luckily so otherwise saying, I wouldn't be here. If, if you remembered the pain, you wouldn't go back and have the second, yeah? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. And and this is nice where analogy. I think I think, you know, financial markets are much like that. So, you know, the okay, incentives to so kick the can down the road and the ability to have a short term memory are two things that mean this could go on a lot longer than we think. All right. So it could go on and on. Maybe it doesn't happen in the next 12 months. Even if it does, maybe we it looks like on the surface we recover as we appeared to in 2008. Yeah. Uh, we appear to recover. Everybody forgets about it. In that case, this could just go on ad infinitum. Pretty much. I think there's the real possibility that the Federal Reserve could drop, you know, 300 points, the rates by 300 points, and then, hey, we're back off to the races. They pump in liquidity. And then back to that short-term mentality, everyone, yay, we're rich again and we're buying whatever you're buying when you think you're rich and yeah ferraris and lambos if you're into crypto or more sats if you're into bitcoin um you know and this is where i think there's the very real possibility that a 300 basis point drop and some liquidity could forget all of the issues that we're currently seeing and would solve the commercial banking or the commercial real estate problem that's about to pop its head up across the regional banks um but i just don't know what the what they're really trying to achieve because I think the inflation numbers are very rubbery. I think the unemployment numbers are very rubbery. Reminds me of that joke about, you know, how do you know you've got a good accountant? Oh, you know, tell me. Well, you know, if you want to know if you've got a good accountant, just ask them what's one plus one. And if they're any good, they're going to look over their shoulder, look back at you, close the windows, and then they're going to lean into your whisper. What do you want it to be? 
<laughs> that's great. Uh, okay, and that's the whole system, right? Literally, that is the system that we're operating in. And this is where once you understand what Bitcoin represents, an immutable ledger that can never be changed, that's run by a set of system, well, run. it's a system run by rules, not rulers. You know, everyone can basically, you know, run a node and check that, you know, their Bitcoin sitting in their wallet. It, it's a complete paradigm shift for the system that we're operating in. Okay, so if we can keep kicking the can down the road forever, do we ever really need sound money? At some point in time, yeah, we do. And what happens, I think, along the road of, you know, the fiat system is that more and more people get disenfranchised from the system that it is. And I look back over the last, say, two years, what we've seen in Bitcoin and, you know, the broader geopolitical system. We've seen a 51% attack on Bitcoin with China banning Bitcoin mining in mm -hmm. April 2021. Despite that, Bitcoin worked perfectly. It was slow. Blocks were slow. It took maybe three months to adjust, but it was not an existential threat. It just slowed it down. Um, I find that absolutely incredible that that doesn't get more attention. But, you know, that was a huge validation for Bitcoin and the network that it is and how resilient. Then if I look at, the say, the two major geopolitical events that have happened, I look at the Canadian truckers. Mm -hmm. um, the protests that they went through. And this was a fundamental betrayal of one of our foundational values that you are innocent until proven guilty across all Western democracies. We effectively have that law due to, you know, British rule that's basically filtered through all of the col colonies. It's a, it's a representation of fairness and equity in our legal system that mm -hmm. I think was fundamentally breached when the Canadian government said, we're going to freeze your bank accounts without any due process. We don't know if you're guilty or innocent, but we're going to basically take this power and we're going to pause your transactions on this account. Now, I understand that they could have been terrorists wanting to take over the government, the rest of it, but you have a standing military there if that's the real threat. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a fundamental breach of those citizens' rights. And so to me, that was a huge endorsement for censorship-resistant money that should have been a red flag to any Canadian that if they want to own, you know, or have the ability to transfer value and secure that without mm -hmm. any interference from their government, then Bitcoin should be, you know, top and centre of their their priority list to, to secure. Mm -hmm. The other geopolitical event that happened that was enormous that we seem to have just memory hold and not coming back is, you know, Russia basically having their foreign reserves seized. And I say seized because although the media tells you they were not seized, they were just frozen. If I don't have, if I can't control something that I own, it's fundamentally seized. It's outside yeah. of my control. And yeah. look, I'm not sitting here, you know, making apologies for Russia. I don't want to get into the political fight. You know, that's not my shtick here. But what is a fundamental right is if I own something and I want to have the right or the access or the ability to use it how I wish. I don't want a third party telling me how I should be behaving in order to do something with my property. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a fundamental overreach from the US government that, you know, look, I don't think we're going to see the end of the US dollar hegemony anytime soon. But, you know, that was, you know, maybe it was the... a big deal. It was a turning point and it wasn't flagged nearly to the Correct. degree that it could have and should have been in the media. That, for me, was the day that broke the US dollar. And you're right, it's not going away in a hurry. But as um, Greg Foss would say, it's the um, it's still the strongest horse in the in the glue factory. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's deeply concerning. And as a result of that, what, of course, we're already seeing is the BRICS nations, which could soon include Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, all looking to find ways to, uh, you know, to trade internationally outside of the US dollar in their own currencies. Clearly, Russia and China are doing the same. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, and China's looking to do that. So BHP is now, as far as I know... Their first iron um, ore contract in Yuan. Yes, 
Correct. cannot believe it. I'm like, oh, my goodness, the great Australian. No. Unbelievable, right? So we are seeing this move away. And whilst everyday folk, uh, which is a terribly condescending term when I stop to think about it, but a lot of people are entirely kind of unaware of, you know, if you're really caught up in reality TV and Kardashians and whatever, do you really care about the Canadian truck drivers and the no. seizing of the, you know, of course you don't. But uh, but once you start, and, you, and you'll blame everything but the real issue, mm -hmm. but once you start, once that power starts sifting away from the US dollar, see, I suppose this is, you can kick the can down the road in terms of debt, but once you start getting countries trading without the US dollar, that's a massive paradigm shift. Yeah. And that was all the trigger from that Russian, that Russian moment. I, I agree. And with, without catastrophizing it, I, I don't think anyone's really too keen on holding, you know, Indian rupees or Chinese yuan, like that Chinese in foreign exchange system that they've got. They've got an internal currency and an external currency. It's all bullshit. Like fun the French, but I'm like, yeah. BHP doing that. That was just a that was a headline. I'll be be really interested to see how they you know how they structure their contracts moving forward because i wouldn't be taking a dollar of you know chinese yuan i think it's rubbish and as as bad as the us is in the overreach that i think they you know sort of planted the seed for seed of doubt in their currency and their their role as the you know global reserve currency yeah. it's it's still the cleaner shirt and the dirty pile yeah and and this is where it's going to be a long time i think for china to prove that it's worthy of that you know, in 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 that whole BRICS cohort, you've got um, Russia trying to get rid of rupees. You know, they said, yeah, we'll take rupees, but now they've got them. They're like, oh, my God, what do we do with these things? You know, 83% of trade or more is still in US dollars. They don't really want to trade in that. What's going to be interesting, I think, is what happens when these nations figure out Bitcoin? And we've seen Bitcoin move to, say, in Russia is now the second largest Bitcoin miner or has the second most hashing rate on mm -hmm. earth. You know, without sort of wanting to say too many expletives, it's a BFD. It's a big freaking deal. And, you know, that can't be understated. Once they figure out, oh my goodness, you know, they're going to go through a natural progression just like you and I have when it comes to figuring out Bitcoin. They've figured out, okay, this is a really good money for circumventing the SWIFT system because it's seizure resistant and censorship resistant. So we can transact we mm -hmm. can't have it seized that's a good thing um in addition to that this monetizes all of that wasted stranded energy that we've got up in siberia in the you know absolute boondocks of earth that's very difficult to get to market you know they're, they're, they can transport oil but it's very difficult to build a you know a gas pipeline that pipes the gas in and they have got mountains of free gas just spewing out into the air because they can't monetize it so what do they do they chuck up Bitcoin miners up there. They figure out, hey, we can monetize this thing that we were literally just burning in the air. Mm -hmm. And oh my goodness, wow, look at this. We, we've got more hash rate than anyone else on earth bar the US. And we're monetizing it. And there's roughly $7 billion of annual revenues now, or maybe more, but that's where the price is now. Mm -hmm. Next year, if price doubles, you know, that'll be 16 to $20 billion of revenue for miners. All of a sudden, if we can get 25% of the hash rate, that's a free $5 billion, $5 billion worth of Bitcoin that we're, we're generating for literally using our stranded energy. And then once they've figured out they can monetize the stranded energy, they realize, hey, this is actually a really good asset to hold and no one can seize it. No one can censor it. Why don't we try getting our oil and gas contracts that we're exporting oil in paid in Bitcoin? And they're already effectively doing that with Europe because they've asked Europe to pay, you know, in Russian rubles and they've got an exchange rate with the gold. So it's not going to be too long before the Russians, you know, they're not stupid. They're great with, no. you know, all of the STEM, you know, STEM, um, math, oh, look, they're the hackers reference. of the world. And once they realize they can't hack Bitcoin, <laughs> they're going to, they're going to use it. And then they're going to get it. They're going to, yeah. 100%. And, and, and this is what I find really interesting is that that, Oil and gas market, one of the largest gas mar um, one of the largest markets on earth, is a two and a half trillion dollar market per annum. So what happens when two and a half trillion in global, you know, USD 
moves to Bitcoin. All of a sudden, right. you know, the numbers get really stupid very quickly because there's not 2 million Bitcoin available for sale. There's 2 million on exchange. They're going to have to provide, you know, you know, that works out at roughly, call it 6 to $8 billion of daily liquidity that they're going to have to use to purchase that oil and gas on a global basis. All of a sudden, if they figure out that we want to be paid in Bitcoin, you know, the Saudis, the Russians, that sets the precedence and the dominoes to fall for everyone else to say, damn it, we'll, we'll do that too. Amazing to think about. And so really what we're saying is, uh, and see, this is what Jason, I, I was going to just start talking about adoption and the order of adoption being, you know, clearly El Salvador, and we're seeing a lot in Africa at the moment, kind of Nigeria and Namibia and, and Ken, uh, did I just say uh, Kenya, South Africa. So we're seeing a lot going on there. So we've always thought of this as a kind of bottom up movement. Mm. And yet what you're really saying is uh, it's going to move quickly into from bottom up what you're going to get nation states potentially trading in Bitcoin, maybe even before we've got institutional adoption, let alone US uh, government or central bank adoption. Is that really what you're perceiving? Yeah. Yeah. And and, okay. and this is this is where I think once they get it, <laughs> excuse me, once they understand that, you know, it's it's a bottom up movement until it's not. Yeah. And this is right. this is this is literally where I go to bed thinking, you know, once someone in a nation state of significance understands this, like El Salvador, hats off to you know Bukele, he's you know doing God's work and absolutely smashed it out mm -hmm. of the park. Prime down. You know, GDP through the roof, tourism through the roof. You know, all of the export, or sorry, the you know the the tourist visas or the visas he's issuing out for you know tax exemptions for for tech innovators and the rest of it. Brilliant job, but in the grand scheme of things, El Salvador is literally a pimp on an elephant. Like, yeah, it's nothing in the terms of global trade. But what happens when you know Russia or the Saudis figure that out and just say, you know what, we've got, well, we had five hundred billion in foreign reserves. We're just going to pump all of that into Bitcoin and we're going to buy every single available Bitcoin that we can sitting on exchanges. And this is where, you know, it's a bottom up movement until it's not. And this is where once a nation state understands that and they've got an unlimited printing press, you know, it will take them, you know, I would have thought maximum two months to organize everything that they need to. And then overnight, they could literally have 5% of the global supply of Bitcoin. They could buy a million coins overnight. And they'll just set a floor at a million dollars. We go to sleep, we wake up and we're, you know, checking our phones, thinking, is this right? Calling our friends. Hey, it looks like Bitcoin's now at a million dollars. Is that right? And it's like, yeah, because someone with deep pockets and an endling, you know, an endless printing press has just said, bye, bye, bye. And they're just going to buy until literally their bags are full. Until someone figures out what's happening and says, fuck, stop selling to them because... <laughs> They're just mopping up. <laughs> Literally. And, and that's that's what I expect. I, I fully expect that to happen at some point in the next five to ten years. Wow. Okay. So um have you do you know much about Jason, Jason Lowry's thesis? Have you yes. read much? Yeah. Have you read the thesis? Have you actually read Soft War? I've listened to him a lot. Right. Um, yeah. I've got that on my desk ready to go through. There are like I have studied Jason and I think he's I think he brings an interesting viewpoint to Bitcoin that I really appreciate. Really appreciate. And of course, his big thing is, his big concern is that Russia and China are cotton on to Bitcoin as a defence. He's not really talking about Bitcoin. He's talking about the technology behind, the protocol behind Bitcoin, as opposed to the tradable peer-to-peer -peer cash. Uh, yeah. And he's talking about the um, proof of work, fundamentally, as being a form of cyber security. Yeah. Uh, and I know he's really working with Department of Defense and now Washington and US government in uh, getting US on board before China and Russia got on. Yeah. Uh, and what happens internationally, though, if we end up then with one government stocking up? and the others go, therefore, we're not going to get involved. Do you get 
game theory that <laughs> says we have to catch up? Yep. Or do you get politics that says we refuse to get involved in that if they're already in it? You'll get both. And that's the beauty of watching 167 nation states with their own currency determine their own path here. You're going to watch people say, no, we're going to we're going to avoid that. And it's just going to be watching people literally shooting themselves in the foot. They're only harming themselves and their own citizens. And then you'll find other countries that say, shit, all right, well, they've set the price at, you know, a million dollars a coin. The US dollar is a bigger, better currency than that. We'll set the floor at $10 million a coin. So anyone who wants to sell, we'll buy at $10 million a coin. And this is where you get into competitive you know, tension across nations really quickly. And to Jason's work and, you know, from what I've read through so far, um, one of the things that I think is really missing from the Bitcoin argument around what this technology is, is that this is first and foremost a communications technology. It's not a monetary technology. The monetary technology that we ascribe to it is an abstraction layer across, like above the actual network. And this is back to the risk and volatility that we talk of. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's the most secure network on earth. However, it's really volatile when you put a price of US dollar abstraction on top of that network. Wildly mm -hmm. volatile, very low risk. And yeah. this is where I hope I get to read in that um, thesis that he's put together. Um, my understanding of war and engagements is the number one thing to secure on the battlefield is your communications, particularly when you're organising, you know, Marines, Navy and Air Force. Mm -hmm. The number one thing that you have to secure, the first thing you secure, the number one priority on any battlefield engagement is the comms. Mm -hmm. And what, what is Bitcoin at its most basic level? It's a communication system. Mm, I haven't read and I'm almost towards the end. I'm down to about the last 50 pages. I haven't heard haven't him say that. it that way. But what he is talking about is to the degree that we have a defence force around, you know, air, sea, land, space. Yeah. What we don't have is a defence force around cyber. Correct. And yeah. in effect, proof of work creates that. Correct. I haven't heard him specify cons so far, particularly. Yeah. But it's a broader issue around cyber uh, cyber warfare and securing securing systems securing yourself having a defense force having a, a cyber defense force yeah this this is where I'd, I'd love to have a chat with jason i think he's a brilliant mind he's offering a, a new point of view to bitcoin that i think he gets a lot of heat from a lot of people but i'm i'm glad he's out there you know discussing these ideas the the other thing that i think he doesn't consider but it might be just my brain operating very differently to attack vectors from a societal perspective. But I look at time locking of Bitcoin, Bitcoin being the first quantum asset as a huge threat to any nation state who doesn't start investing and purchasing Bitcoin and having their foreign reserves dedicated to buying more Bitcoin. And the reason being is that Time locking of Bitcoin allows us to send Bitcoin through time completely untouched. And the only thing that can happen to Bitcoin through time is basically more and more value gets attributed to the Bitcoin network. So that Bitcoin grows in value throughout time. And, you know, an interesting thought experiment, and this is where I actually tried to reach out to Jason to have this discussion with him, but he didn't engage and I totally get it because it's such a, a foreign concept, but having a quantum asset that can go through time and appear at any point in time completely perfect is a huge potential, huge national security risk. And, you know, I, I give the example that let's just say you can send Bitcoin through a, around 800 years, I think is about the limit that you can send it through in the current framework of the network. If you were to send one Bitcoin 800 years into the future, that would probably be the equivalent of tens of trillions of dollars in today's value. And what happens when, say... It suddenly unlocks. Correct. What happens when, Kari, your 14-year-old, um, might want to, sorry, whatever, take that out, but what happens when kids basically have 
you know, $25 trillion appear in their wallet and they've got full control over it. What sort of financial havoc can they wreak on our financial markets when they have access to such capital? This is a huge problem that all of a sudden, if you've got $25 trillion that you can then, you know, cause all sorts of chaos across derivatives markets, credit markets, stock markets, you name it, you can effectively cause any outcome that you want to. And this is a national strategic risk to not adopting Bitcoin. Wow. But to think 800 years in the future, we've literally, I would imagine by then, physically evolved more, let alone from a societal point of view, uh, psychologically. By then, we're probably AI, fully AI automated beings. I don't know what we are at 800 yeah. years from now. It's it's unfathomable. I think there are so many variables that come into that. Me that too. Almost the, the time lock Bitcoin is perhaps a blip in the ocean of all the massive changes that will have taken place between now and then. It, it could be. And, you know, it doesn't need to be 800 years in the future. It can be, you know, you can look at it and say, okay, something a little more palatable for you know our time frames. We could lock it 50 years into the future. And if you look at the block rewards in 50 years, you know, one Bitcoin will be the equivalent of, say, 10 weeks worth of energy. Now, what's that going to be valued at? Is the Bitcoin network going to stop growing? I highly doubt it. Like it's going to be billions of dollars, maybe trillions of dollars in 50 years, one Bitcoin. And and that can still wreak financial havoc. So I mm. I think there is a force for good with that quantum asset in time locking Bitcoin. And there are also some potential risks from a, you know, from mm. a national security perspective. And this is where, you know, I was really reaching out to Jason to give him another attack vector on the US that he wants to mitigate to inspire the US to basically buy a shitload of Bitcoin. So fair call, fair call. So let's talk about the evolution of humanity for a moment and what we imagine over the next 50, 100 years or more. If there were mass Bitcoin adoption, either as a parallel system or a primary financial system, I know you've talked in the past about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, certainly it's something that for whatever reason, it's just one of those models that just the moment I saw it, it lodged in my mind and, you know, never left. Give me your science fiction. What happens in um, in a in a hyper Bitcoinized world? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I think it's really difficult to imagine because mm. my hope is, and and this is the difficulty that I have trouble thinking about, is that what Bitcoin gives us, and this is where I think it is subject to a lot of religious fervor, and I, I don't want to go down that that road because I think the the benefits of this tool to humanity is undeniable. It is of profound significance. And the benefits that we can derive from adopting this is unknown. But I like to speculate and think about, well, we have effectively a system at the moment that is very chaotic. It has contrived incentives that pit one another against each other. It's quite adversarial in that it doesn't allow for the alignment of interests. However, in a hyper-Bitcoinized world, there is one North Star that our system, that our people, that everyone on earth can effectively align themselves with and effectively run towards. And, and what I think is a beautiful thought to think about is what happens if, and, and I might just take a step back, with Bitcoin, I think it gives us humanity the opportunity to ascend that Maslow's needs hierarchy in the fastest way possible. And what fundamentally is that Maslow's needs hierarchy? Well, it's all of our um, physical and psychological needs in order to be our the best versions of ourselves is the most simple way to do that. So what does that look like? To start off with, we need food and shelter. Then we need you know, physical connection. We need love. And then ultimately at the top of that pyramid, we've got self-actualization where we effectively feel like we're doing our version of God's work. And mm -hmm. that's where we are living our best life. We're 
you know, contributing to society, we're contributing to humanity, and we really feel like we have, we are living a purposeful life. And this is where I think a significant investment in Bitcoin and then going through a number of halvings is the fastest way to ascend that Maslow's needs hierarchy that if you put in a huge amount or more than you're comfortable with putting into Bitcoin, each halving will represent a layer up on those six or seven stages of the Maslow's needs hierarchy. So within 20 years or so, you're effectively living a self-actualized life where you know, you're financially secure, you can look after your family and friends, you can connect with them on a deeper level and a loving level. And then you are also left with the options to live your purposeful life in contributing to society in the best way that you see fit. And, and this is the foundation for, for each and every person doing that is I believe Bitcoin gives us an opportunity to align 8 billion different people's interests into running the same way. And I think all of a sudden the opportunity for humanity having effectively a, a North Star you know, or a true north for our society, for every single person, and aligning everyone's interest to perform in that set in in that same way, run the same way. Mm -hmm. The the differences to society is so profound. I can't even begin to imagine. You know, I think it would inspire you know mm -hmm. an almost a you know a renaissance of, mm -hmm. of artisanship. People doing their jobs would be doing their jobs because they love it, not because mm -hmm. they have to there'll be a sense of pride instilled into everyone's work that they do. And this is something that I think fiat on a, a much deeper level, working in a fiat system and all of the controls and, and the systems that we work in with the fiat monetary system effectively robs people of dignity when they work, because not only do they not get to contribute or feel like they're contributing or moving ahead, they, they're effectively getting robbed with inflation as well. So it's mm. insult to injury, whereas a deflationary money, monetary system allows us to return dignity to all sorts of work, any work. You could argue, though, that life on a gold standard was far from perfect. Absolutely, it was. It was far from perfect. But it didn't allow the incentives to be corrupted because there was still the the gold standard to fall back on, that still need to be held. So there was far less frivolous spending. There was less incentive to deliver poorer outcomes because when you're on a system that can be debased at the touch of a button, as opposed to debased mm. by actually having to purchase gold or mine gold, it, you are incentivized to effectively cut corners. Yeah. Okay. All right. And that's what you mean by the clash of values or the clash, uh, the conflict of incentives. Correct. So, yep. you know, everyone in that environment is effectively trying to cut corners to take more profit for them, from, for themselves. Whereas in a Bitcoin standard, I believe that people will become effectively artists with their work and you will deliver over and above just to, you know, to earn that Bitcoin. Because, you know, if you don't deliver over and above, firstly, they're not going to pay you. Or secondly, you'll never get another year. Mm -hmm. And this is where it completely upends the incentive structures that we've got and I think inspires people to live at their best and deliver their best. Whereas at the moment, you know, working for minimum wage at McDonald's is hardly inspiring people to be their best. So uh, that requires a lot of faith in humanity. You're really saying, uh, see, my concern no, is, no? no? No, it doesn't require any faith in humanity. All it requires faith in is that our little reptilian brains are greedy and fearful. And that's our primary driver. If you look at our core fundamental driver, it's mm -hmm. the reptilian brain. You know, when we're under stress, what do we revert to? We revert to fear and greed. They're the primary drivers of all other drivers. So I'm not relying on people's faith in humanity to deliver outcomes. What I'm relying on is people's fear and greed on the most basic of level to do the right thing. That's from an incentives point of view. I guess I'm thinking uh, maybe, and maybe you, you are answering this at the same time, but in terms of Maslow's hierarchy, once everyone's got their base needs met, do they self-actualise or do they plonk down in front of a TV with a can of beer? Great question. I don't know. I think probably a good way to look at this would be look at the, the rat study who were doing cocaine. Oh. And, you know... Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. I, 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 literally, we are not too far off that from a from an evolutionary perspective. The, oh, the sure. Rat, the rats who were living in a you know in a shitty environment, who were basically under stress, no sunlight, all sorts of you know poor environmental conditions for them. They went back to the cocaine well or the sugar well to basically feed themselves on it because it was almost like a you know an sedative for them to take the pain away. Put in a very different environment where they were thriving and loving it, and you know there was a sense of community and whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. There was no cocaine consumption. Yeah. So I think you know we're not too different to mouse. We we haven't evolved that far past that little mouse brain. So I think people. There will sure there will be some people who'll sit on a couch with a, a beer or whatever and think, hey, I'm living my best life. But I think fundamentally we're all human and we 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 need a connection, we need a love with other people in order to feel like we're doing our best. And I don't think sitting in front of the TV is going to deliver that. It might deliver it for a week or two, but it's not going to deliver a long-term outcome that people want to pursue. And this is where, you know, I, I look at and think. Let's just say Bitcoin, we go to sleep tonight. Bitcoin is at $10 million tomorrow. Now, there's going to be a lot of us who look at that and go, great, and then we're going to go back to doing what we're doing. Yep. However, there are going to be some people who have a hole in them, I believe, that need to fill that by buying you know, a big watch, buying a fast car, buying a big house, a big boat, a plane or whatever. And it's like, great, okay, well, they can do that. And, and they're going to do that and they're going to get it out of their system and then they're going to realise shit, I, I still haven't dealt with the pain or the lack of connection or the things that are missing in my life that I think I can fill with, you know, basically goods. And that's a very empty place to be, a very unhappy place to be. And hopefully, you know, that's very quickly out of the system and they can start connecting with people because I think that's where the, the real joy of, of life comes about. No doubt, no doubt. Um, really, what a wide-ranging, interesting kind of conversation. Um, are you going to write a book? I think you need to write a book, Peter. <laughs> 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 because you've got thoughts outside of what even the standard Bitcoiner is talking about. Thank you. That's very. That, that's a, a great honour to hear that from you, Kari. It's, uh, well, look, I think it's on the cards. I think it's on the cards. It's feeling like we might be moving towards, you know, I like to keep these at about an hour. I'm conscious of people's time and maybe they're just listening as they're commuting and, you know, maybe they've only got half an hour, an hour. I feel like, on the other hand, I could keep talking to you for another hour or two uh, and maybe this needs to turn into a series at some stage, you know. I'd love to actually have you back on. Um, do you, like, has this brought up, I, I, I'm really, I'm more than happy to extend it. Are you feeling like there's stuff that's really just percolating out of this conversation that you feel like, oh, I just, I need to expand on this, or there's something left unsaid, or there's loads of things unsaid, obviously, but that I just, are there thoughts you'd like to just throw out there that there's, we haven't really touched on yet? Yeah, there's a lot. I, I could talk to you all night. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that's great. That's great. What's most okay? Let me ask this: What is most on your mind around Bitcoin at the moment? Like, what's really kind of tickling your fancy and getting you kind of even more? You know, like to the degree that we go deeper and deeper, and kind of each iteration gets us thinking about different things. I know that that time lock is big on your mind at the moment yeah what else is kind of going on either around that or more broadly for you i i think there is a few things i'm really excited by and i don't think too many people are but i'm really excited about the the u.s regulations on the crypto and the choke point that they're instituting i think that could be a little bit detrimental to bitcoin but i think it's going to be massively positive for bitcoin I think that's going to put a huge focus on the altcoins and the VCs who have participated uh, in that sector and dumped on retail. I think those companies who are pursuing that as an investment strategy are going to be under huge pressure. 
and the founders of the new token or the new new Bitcoin are going to be served Wells notices and under severe SEC scrutiny um, in light of what's gone on. And for everyone who's concerned about the SEC and what that means for Bitcoin, I, I think they've you know fundamentally ruled on Bitcoin already. They've given it a pass and they've mm. handed it off um, from a regulatory perspective to the CFTC. So that to me gives Bitcoin a you know a clear clear view to basically run full steam ahead. So thinking about what this this next couple of years looks like, all of a sudden I think there's going to be a huge amount of capital that can't really get into the crypto sphere that it would like to, and it's going to have to settle. And I say settle in inverted commas for Bitcoin. And and my hope is that they discover um, an asset that has huge long term potential not only from a from a monetary perspective with a return, but it has a much deeper impact on society that can move us forward and I think has the fastest or the best chance of you know helping us evolve to that higher level in the fastest way possible. So there's there's so much to be grateful for. There's so much to look forward to. The next two to three years, particularly five years, I think is going to be incredible, like a great place to be. So that's one of the things I'm looking at. One of the other things that I'm trying to get um, more and more people interested in and focused on is making sure that everyone gets their Bitcoins off exchange because if we have that top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach where a, you know, a government or a major corporation just says, we're going to buy every Bitcoin on exchange, you know, you might wake up and, you know, look at the price of Bitcoin being a million bucks and say, yeah, I'm rich, and then realize that the exchange you've left it on doesn't have any. They sold it to the to the guy who basically bought it and put it in their wallet. And this is where I you know, send, spend a lot of my time personally making sure that all of our clients have got Bitcoins off exchange. They are set up in a multi-sig uh, collaborative, can ensure that they're going to be looked after if anything like that happens. So there's a lot to be excited about, and they're probably two things that come to top of mind. The Bitcoin advisor business has been effectively something that I'm looking to spin off from the time, energy and effort that I've put into our families in effectively safe custodying their Bitcoins and giving advice on on Bitcoin um, to these families. Uh, I'm ideally trying to develop a multi-seed collaborative custody protocol that I want to give to anyone who will take it. It's a protocol that we've used personally to ensure multiple um, transfers from, sadly, we've had a number of clients who have passed away and we've been able to transfer those Bitcoins safely from the deceased to their family, to their beneficiaries, their executor, their wives, their children. Um, and, and that's a very unique skill set that I haven't seen too many other advisors in the world actually manage that process through. And, and this is where I think what's very difficult about Bitcoin is because it's effectively a digital bearer asset, regardless of what the probate says, you still need to manage that process on a physical basis with Bitcoin. And it's unlike any other asset that in probate, when you go through that, that whole legal process, they've got effectively, uh, you look at property, properties have got title deeds with the you know, the the government, you look at the share certificates, they've got share certificates with whoever you're registered with. There's always an authority to appeal to in order to get safe custody of the asset, yeah. unless, unless it's Bitcoin. And this is what's terrifying for me in the safe transfer of Bitcoin to, you know, from clients to who they want to give it to, that there's no appeal to authority. There's no one to turn around and say, hey, here's the new owner of this, here's the death certificate, here's the notarized, you know, uh, will, here's the notarized um, ID for the executor, and can you just transfer that Bitcoin to this person because this legal document said? Cryptography doesn't care about the legal document. So unless someone has actually gone through that process and can transfer their Bitcoin without them being there, mm -hmm. this Bitcoin... And, and this is the unique thing about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the first asset that we can literally store in our head and go to our grave and not leave for someone else. And from an estate planning perspective, I find that terrifying because personally, I work so hard to get clients into Bitcoin. I see the change and the improvements that it makes in people's lives. 
when it's going up, when it's down, it's a bit depressing, but we'll talk about the positives. Um, and on a serious note, you know, all that hard work can be undone by not having effectively a tested procedure for transferring that Bitcoin to your loved ones. And this is where I spend a lot of my time because my day to day is thinking about how to do that in the mm. best, most efficient manner for clients. And it's something I suggest everyone think about. I don't, I, I don't pretend to tell anyone how to do that for themselves, but I, I want to share the process that we use internally here um, that's proven a safe way of doing that. Great. Well, I'll be sure to include those links below. Are you, um, are you able to do that for international clients as much as local? Yes. At the moment, yeah. we've got clients across the UK, Portugal, um, broader Europe, Canada, the US, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Singapore. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing some people, but in short, there's not a country. As long as they've got internet, we'll be able to look after them. So thank you. Great stuff. Well, look, Peter, this has been such a pleasure. And of course, you work not far from where I grew up. So, uh, and where my father still lives. So God willing, uh, one day after the Miami conference, I'm going to come back to Sydney and uh, Dad and I are together going to come visit you, I reckon. I would love to have a coffee with all of you. It would be a lot of fun. It really will be. Peter, thank you so much for your generosity of time and intellect and knowledge. What an absolute honour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. All the best.